Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to thank Pilgrims for asking me to present and providing a venue for a presentation in these difficult times uh, on this very important topic. Since we are doing this on Facebook and also uh, for YouTube as well, we have a means by which you can uh, message us if you're having problems with the audio or visual or anything, so please let us know. Thank you. So tonight, uh, Pilgrims has asked me to present on this topic that I have a lot of experience at. It's on the topic of my talk is regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy, fact, fiction, and the future, and I'm Dr. Joanne Halbert. So really, what drew, draws people into this talk is talking about stem cell therapy, but appropriately, this should be called orthobiologics, and I'll let you know why. Well, when we do stem cell therapy, that has to be done under an FDA-approved study, so most of the stem cell therapy that you hear about really is not technically stem cell therapy. People are using biologics. So a biologic is a substance from a living organism, and when we talk about orthobiologics, we're talking about human cells or tissue that are used for orthopedic conditions. So as a consumer, it's really confusing. What's the best? Who do I trust? There's so many choices. There's bone marrow, there's fat, umbilical cord, amniotic tissue, and lately we've been hearing a lot about exosomes. And so just to let you know what my experience is in this, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I have 25 years of experience in private practice. I'm fellowship trained in sports medicine. I started implementing biologics into my practice four years ago, and I've done this on hundreds of patients. And I, I'm also a member of the Biologics Association. This is a collaboration of orthopedic surgeons that are speaking with a unified voice with regard to the use of biologics in medical practice. And I'm their national director of patient advocacy. And so I'm here because I want to be your advocate as a patient with regard to you being safe and getting as much information as possible about this field. So my practice philosophy comes from one of my mentors, Dr. Morgan, that there's no condition that cannot be made worse by the wrong surgical procedure. So I want to make sure that if I'm doing surgery on someone, that they're going to get better from the surgery and that's medically indicated. And so in my practice, I tend to be more of a conservative orthopedic surgeon. So when I have patients who have shoulder pain, I'm setting them the physical therapy. I'm using the posture shirt, and um, you can see here on, in the lower right-hand corner, and doing things more conservatively. And so I found with osteoarthritis, we can do physical therapy, we can do anti-inflammatories, and then we go to injections like the hyaluronic acid, which we know is kind of like the loop job and steroid injections. But there's a big gap between these injections and doing a knee replacement, so putting plastic and metal in the knee. So there's a huge gap. So I was looking for alternatives or other things that I could use in my practice. And so I started to do some research. So I went on PubMed, which is a great place for all of you to look for studies, and I found several studies using mesenchymal stem cells for osteoarthritis. And then I started going to meetings, meetings that I didn't normally go to as a pig surgeon, these scientific meetings where you have PhDs presenting on research from all over the planet. And I met this man, Dr. Arnold Kaplan. And as you'll see, he's a very important person with regard to stem cell therapy and research. And so as a result, I became an early adopter of regenerative medicine and biologics. And so I presented at national meetings, done webinars, and now I have two papers that are published in our most prestigious orthopedic journal, the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. The first paper was looking at ethics of direct and consumer marketing of stem cell clinics. And then the second, which we published just this January, is we looked at 900 stem cell clinic websites and found that 96% of them give this information. So that's, that's really important as well and, and troubling as well. So let's start out with the science of this. Regenerative medicine, let's look at basic science and what's really important to our FDA regulations that you don't see in a lot of these seminars and presentations. So I hope I'm gonna clarify this for you and it's a lot of information. And so I'll try to present it in a way that um, you can understand it and use this as a resource in the future for you. So first of all, if we had an audience here, I'd ask people, well, what's a stem cell? And so uh, a lot of people will say the cell that can turn into other cells and stuff like that. And so uh, patients will say, do you get stem cells from embryos? And is it illegal in the United States? Do I have to go to a foreign country like the Dominican Republic? Well, stem cells, if we look online in the dictionary, it's a simple cell that can develop to any, into any various types of cells. 
And so the origin of stem cells are either embryonic or adult. And so this is where Dr. Kaplan comes in. And so Dr. Kaplan has become a good friend of mine, and I'm using his slides with his permission. So Dr. Kaplan, back in 1988, took some bone marrow, and he spun it down, and he found that there was a layer of cells he didn't know what they were. So he plated them out and found that they stuck to plastic, and they developed, they developed these little colonies. And then he exposed them to really powerful chemicals and found that these cells could differentiate into bone, into cartilage, into tendon, muscle, nerve. And so embryonically, these are cells or tissues from the mesenchyme, which is a tissue layer in the embryo. So he called these mesenchymal stem cells. And this is a, a, a chart that he has from 1988 where he has these different cells and showing the different cell lines that they can develop into. He's very, very sorry that he called them mesenchymal stem cells. And now he talks all over the world on how we shouldn't call them stem cells. And so this is why. Because when we look at an MSC, they all start out as pericytes. So we can see that the this is a capillary actually in heart tissue. And these cute little pink cells are pericytes. And so when the pericyte is subject to inflammation or injury, it breaks off of that blood vessel and it turns into an activated MSC. And that activated MSC does not act at all the way an MSC does in the lab. So in lab is in vitro, and in the body is in vivo. So in the body, these cells do not differentiate. So when you see people advertising that we can inject stem cells in your body, and they're turned into any tissue they want, or they can um, get rid of your arthritis, that's completely untrue. That's not what they do in the body, and that's what current science tells us. And so what do MSCs do? MSCs sense that surrounding environment, and they make proteins that are anti-inflammatory, that inhibit scar tissue formation. They promote the growth of blood vessels. They promote tissue regeneration. They're also antibacterial, and they bind to opiate receptors. And so they secrete these proteins, and I just listed a few of them, like the first one, vascular endothelial growth factor. That's for growing blood vessels. And so they also can stimulate tissue-specific progenitor cells. So a progenitor stem cell is a stem cell that can only be a limited number of things. So here I have a progenitor cell that can only be cartilage or bone. And so that's how we can potentially get tissue regeneration, is this activated MSC can stimulate a progenitor cell in that specific tissue. So Dr. Kaplan has proposed that we still use the acronym MSC, but we call them medicinal signaling cells because these cells act like little drugstores. They sense that surrounding environment, and they produce proteins to affect that surrounding environment to promote healing and tissue regeneration. So now let's get to FDA considerations. So the FDA has had regulations for many years now, but they realized as this industry started growing that there was a lot of confusion. So they came out with a guidance in November of 2017 for industry. And in that guidance, they classified these human cells and tissues as either 361 or 351. Okay, so don't lose me here because this is really important. So 361 cells or tissue are human cells or tissue, and they, they don't need FDA approval as long as they're being used for homologous use, which means the same basic function as where they came from, and they can't be more than minimally manipulated. So we can't alter the original relevant characteristics of that cell or tissue. So let's clarify this and say, okay, homologous use, same basic function. So let's make the analogy these cells are like little workers on your house. So you've got your plumber, and you've got your electrician, and you've got your carpenter. And if we have the plumber you know, doing plumbing, as we can see on the left, and the painter painting, that's homologous use when those people or cells are doing what they're supposed to do. But non-homologous use is when we ask that painter to fix the leaky toilet. So he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing. And so, so industry can't um, advertise or use this for non-homologous use if we consider it what's called 361. What's minimal manipulation? So if we take a banana and we slice that banana up, it still looks like a banana, right? But if we take that banana and we stick it in a blender and we grind it up, that's considered more than minimal. And so you can use tissue that's not homologous or more than minimally manipulated and marketed. However, now you've created a drug and you're required to get FDA approval. And so you need to get an IND for an investigative drug and a biologic license application. And so this is a lengthy process, requires hundreds of millions of dollars and takes many, many years because not only do we have to prove safety, but we also have to prove efficacy. 
So if we look at the FDA regulations with regard to homologous use, and we look at the stuff that's out there, bone marrow. Bone marrow obviously makes cells, it makes blood cells. So industry can't market it for orthopedic condition. But the FDA looks at fat as cushioning and a structural tissue. So it can be marketed for cushioning in joints where there is fat. Homologous use, as we know, embryonic membrane, uh, the amniotic membrane, it's a barrier. So if you're using it as a barrier, then that's homologous use, but you can't market it for orthopedics, or industry can't market it for orthopedics. That's not homologous use. Umbilical cord blood obviously supplies blood cells to the fetus. So again, it can't be marketed for orthopedic conditions by industry. So as an aside, if we look at umbilical cord and amniotic tissue, I see a lot of clinics are advertising that they're doing umbilical cord stem cell therapy or amniotic stem cell therapy. A couple of very prominent labs have got many products from companies all over the country, had them delivered uh, according to the manufacturer's instructions, and then they looked at these cells and found that none of them had any living cells in them. So they could say it's a stem cell product, but there's not all the stem cells are dead. And so most of these products have no living cells, and many of them have no cells at all in them. And so if you look at the number of growth factors, which are those proteins that affect, have a beneficial effect on the tissue, there are fewer of those growth factors in these tissues or uh, products than there is in your own PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. And so then, if you look, back in September, the FDA realized a lot of these companies that were selling umbilical cord and amniotic products were marketing it for non-homologous use. So they sent out 20 warning letters to different companies and said, hey, you're marketing this for non-homologous use. You need to get an IND. And the thing is, is that these companies are still marketing these products. And what's happened is, is the FDA in that 2017 guidance says, we're giving you guys 36 months to come clean. And so if you don't come clean and apply for an IND before then and still market it, we're going to start prosecuting. And they are already prosecuting companies right now. They're targeting stuff that comes from, you know, someone else like the amniotic or umbilical tissue as, as, as opposed to your own tissue. They're also targeting stuff that's being administered intravenously, which is completely illegal unless you're doing an FDA approved study. Also, when we look at these tissues from other people, there's a risk of complications and infections because you don't necessarily know how they're processed. So this is an article that was published in the New York Times in December of 2018, where these people used umbilical cord blood products and 12 patients got infections. And I actually had the rep in my office trying to market this product to me and telling me that it was a stem cell product. And she showed me these white papers, which are not published studies, and said, oh, yes, we have lots of stem cells. And I said, I know how you identify a stem cell, and your product has white blood cells in it. And after she argued with me for a little bit, I said, I'm not going to use your product. And then, unfortunately, other practitioners, you know, used this product and gave their patients infections. And so, you know, it was really pretty serious in some and so um, you, you can't advertise for orthopedic conditions these products, the non-homologous use, but a physician can use it off-label. So I can sit down with my patient and say, listen, uh, this product isn't supposed to be used. This is not homologous use. However, I've seen several studies, peer-reviewed studies, that show clinical efficacy and benefit. So a doctor can use something off-label or, again, for non-homologous use. However, if the product is more than minimally manipulated, the doctor can't use that at all. It's completely illegal. And if the doctor did use that product, they're acting as a biologic manufacturing facility illegally using this drug. So no one can use any products that are more than minimally manipulated unless they've gone through that process to get the IND. And so now you're looking at marketing a drug. And so I like to make the analogy. So say a big drug company like Pfizer comes out with a drug for high blood pressure. Pfizer can't just sell that to clinics and have them administer that to patients without doing study to show that it's safe and it's efficacious. But there's all sorts of companies right now that are selling these biologics without any testing that have been more than minimally manipulated that basically have created a drug and they're marketing and using it illegally, which is a serious concern. So if we look, there are ways of processing fat that are not compliant and makes that banana smoothie. So in the corner here, you can see um, this is where we take fat and we expose it to an enzyme and we create what's called stromal vascular fraction, which is called SVF. So this enzyme just digests the connective tissue and the FDA considers that more than minimally manipulated. 
if that's illegal, again, unless you have the IND. There's another method where you can push the fat through this screen, and what it does is it emulsifies the fat, it breaks up that fat, so again, more than minimally manipulated. And so the FDA, there was a clinic in Florida that was using SPF, so the fat, and it took them four years to prosecute them. And what they had done was they injected several women who had macular degeneration, this SPF, in their eyeballs and blinded them. And they were still operating afterwards. And so it took them, again, four years to shut this clinic down. And so um, here's another thing if we look at more than minimally manipulated. There's amniotic tissue that's freeze dried, and when they wind it up, again, that's more than minimally manipulated. There's several amniotic products on the market right now that do not have an IND that are being used. And they only have a few months to come clean and get them. Big thing right now that's a hot, uh, I'm hearing this, a hot topic is exosomes. Well, what in the world is an exosome? All right, so that MSC gets to this arthritic knee, and it senses the surrounding environment, says, okay, I need to release these proteins to heal this area. So it releases proteins in these little vesicles or these little bags, and it has several proteins in it, and then that goes to the surrounding tissue and affects that tissue tissue to decrease inflammation, promote the growth of blood vessels, promote the growth of tissue. So those little vesicles are called exosomes. And they are specific to that diagnosis and to that environment. So I've seen people advertising as well as industry at national conferences saying, we are using exosome, exosomes and administering that in patients. Exosomes are completely illegal because of the way they're processed. So they take MSCs and they grow them in the lab, and that's called expanding them, and that's more than minimally manipulated. And so they are not at all FDA compliant. So if you go to a clinic and they say we're going to use exosomes, not only are there no clinical studies, they're actually illegal to use them. And so if you don't believe me, this is a warning from the FDA in December of last year that says a clinic in Nebraska is using exosomes and people have gotten infections from it. And here's an email, and it's hard to read this, but this email is from the FDA saying that exosomes are 351 and there are none that are currently approved. And so it's not that you can use this off-label, you can't use it off-label, it's a drug. And so it's processed in a way that it needs to have, it has to go through studies and clinical trials in order for it to be used in any human. So unless you're part of an FDA-approved study, you really you know, shouldn't be participating. And it can be dangerous because this is from someone else and you can get an infection. So salient points, this is the first part, is that MSCs don't differentiate. So when you see someone saying this is going to turn into any cell and it'll, do, it'll rejuvenate your joint, that's not true. What we call this biologics is symptom modifying. So we know that it can decrease inflammation, decrease pain, and we have lots of studies that show that it can. And so we call these medicinal signaling cells. So what do they do? They're anti-inflammatory. They inhibit scar tissue formation. They promote the growth of blood vessels. They inhibit cell death as it's occurring. They're antibacterial, and they bind to opioid receptors. When we looked at, at 361 tissue, we don't need FDA approval if we're using it for homologous use, and it's minimally manipulated. But if we're not marketing it for homologous use, and we're more than minimally manipulating, now it's 351 tissue, and you need that FDA approval. Physicians can use stuff non-homologous, but you have to justify it and use it off-label and justify that with studies. And so no one can use anything that's more than minimally manipulated because this is a drug. What's an example of this? Exosomes. Uh, amniotic membrane that's freeze-dried and ground up, that grinding up is more than minimally manipulated. Fat that's enzymatically digested or fat that's emulsified. So those are drugs and can't be used unless they have an IND. So if we look, now is, we'll take a break. And we'll see if there's any questions that um, people have at this point. Because usually there's a, a few questions. People have heard things from other presentations or they've read some things. So I just want to see if we have anything um, from our viewers. If not, I'll just go on to the second half. So what biologics do I use? Well, if we look, one of the things I like to use is PRP. PRP is something that's taken from your blood. It's spun down. The system that I like to use has a little gel when we centrifuge it. It separates off the plasma from the red blood cell layer. We don't like to inject red blood cells because they're inflammatory. And so what, do, what, do, what does PRP have? It has platelets. 
and platelets release these little alpha granules that have things similar to NSCs, where they are growth factors and proteins that decrease inflammation. They can stimulate cell proliferation or growth. They can increase the production of the components of cartilage, and they can also stimulate parasites to break off of those blood vessels and turn into activated NSCs. And so there are some good studies with regard to using PRP. Uh, a couple of them compare it to using hyaluronic acid, which is that blue job, and found that it was more effective than hyaluronic acid for knee arthritis. And this is for someone with a body mass index less than 30. The obese patients, um, Monica will talk about it in her next talk, but um, obese patients need to, need to lose weight in order to get a better result from this. And then if you look at tennis elbow, there's some good studies comparing the use of PRP to a steroid injection that shows that PRP is more effective. So those are my indications. There's a lot of people that are using it for rotator cuff tears and rotator cuff repairs. There's several studies out that really don't show that it's beneficial or harmful, so it's not something that I use for a rotator cuff tear. So the primary sources, when you're using your own tissue, uh, 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 something that is a biologic is either bone marrow or adipose. And so bone marrow, when we harvest that, it's painful. A lot of times people need sedation. Sometimes people do it in the operating room. The adipose tissue can be done in the office. People say it feels weird. It's not really very painful. And MSCs, in terms of the number of MSCs, there's significantly more MSCs in adipose than bone marrow. It's two to five minute times more. Why is that? Well, the number of MSCs sharply declines with age. So if we look, this is a study done by Dr. Kaplan back in 2007, looking at the MSCs um, in an infant versus uh, an 80-year-old. And so if we look at the number of MSCs in adipose, it remains relatively constant with age. So if we look at a 60-year-old, they have about five MSCs per cc of bone marrow between three and 10,000, in fact. So this is why I use this lipogen systems. This is what I prefer as my other biologic because um, the, the PRP is not a, uh, doesn't have any stem cells in it, but it, it, it's definitely beneficial. So one of the things is patients love donating fat. That's an easy one. And then Dr. Kaplan says, hey, there's more MSCs in fat. you got to use this. So it feels like it's a, a more beneficial um, graft. So fat has lots of good stuff. It has these growth factors. It has adipose derived stem cells. It has these, um, it's very vascular. So you think of all those parasites that are stuck to the blood vessels. And so um, when I do the procedure, um, we stimulate those MSCs and, and activates them. And what I love about the lipogen system is the device itself, which is used for processing the fat, is cleared and it's compliant with FDA regulations. So it's actually cleared for harvesting and concentrating adipose, and it's indicated for orthopedic and arthroscopic surgery. And it complies with the 361 guidance for minimal manipulation. But you know, today is the wild west of advertising with stem cell clinics. And so that's why I like to be able to market something that's not, not only legal, but ethical for my patients. And what's great about lipogems is that we look at the closed system. It, they have this little normal saline bag. We inject the fat in the cylinder, and it's got a filter in here. And it washes out. When you do the harvest, it, you know, it's a mini liposuction. So when you do the harvest, you've got cellular debris, you've got oils, you've got red blood cells. Those are all inflammatory. So the system washes this all out. And it's been used on over 25,000 patients around the world, distributed in 27 countries. And they've got more than 60 peer-reviewed published studies right now. And so if we look, there's a lot of major institutions that are using it, Harvard, Duke, uh, USC. And we have a lot of basic science. This is just for using the lipogems product, as well as clinical studies. And right now, these are all the studies that, that, that are happening um, today in process. So here's me in the office. Uh, doing the harvest, and if we look, it's in the um, device and we shake it up with that microfragments, but that makes it easier to inject. So it just makes the fat into smaller pieces, it doesn't emulsify it, again, it's still 361 compliant with minimal manipulation. So this is what the product looks like um, before we get it into the syringe for injection. Some people say, well, why, why are you using this device uh, versus centrifuge? The things we found with centrifuge is um, it, it really destroys a lot of the cells, and so we have a better cell viability, so more of them are alive, and, and we're also washing out all those contaminants, the, the oils and stuff like that. So I also like to, when I talk to my patients about using a biologic, I like to cite some of the studies um, that I feel are pretty important. One of the ones was in patients with rotator cuff tears. So this was a 10-year follow-up study that was done out of France. They had 90 patients who all had rotator cuff tears. 
they operated on all of them. Half of them, they injected a biologic, which in this case was bone marrow, and then followed them up for 10 years, which is pretty impressive. They found after 10 years, the people who had the biologic injected had an 87% success rate, whereas those that didn't had a 44% success rate. So it's a pretty significant difference in the failure rate. More recently, this study was published using adipose-derived um, stem cells for, again, rotator cuff repair, similar study where they had uh, they repaired them all, but in the one group they injected a biologic, and basically after a year there was double the failure rate in, in the group that did not have the biologic. This is a study that was out of USC with meniscus tears. So this was actually an FDA approved study, and they took fat and they isolated the stem cells. So this was technically stem cell therapy, and what they did was they operated on people who had meniscus tears, and after the surgery injected these stem cells that came from other people, so that's called allogeneic. And then they followed them up and found that many of the patients that they studied grew more than 15% of the meniscus, whereas none of the patients in the control group who didn't have this injected regenerated any meniscus. So this is the first time we've had uh, shown in a study that we can actually regenerate meniscus, which was pretty impressive. So here's a study using the lipogenes product. They call it microfragmented adipose because it breaks it up into smaller pieces. And so this is for knee osteoarthritis. So they had 40 patients, just one injection of the fat with a 12-month follow-up, and 70% improved in their knee scores. 77% said that they injected again. And they found better results with people in more areas of wear of the cartilage, so more cartilage damage. Here's another study using the lipid gems with the microfragmented fat using uh, shoulder pathology. And these are people who have rotator cuff tears as well as osteoarthritis. Again, just one injection of the fat. And these are people who had failed one year of conservative treatment. So we're looking at physical therapy, steroid injections, anti-inflammatories. And so their visual analog scale, which is where you rate your pain on a scale from 1 to 10. So it started out at 7.5, pretty high, the average number at the start of the study. After one year, 3.6 was the average. And then the shoulder and elbow score, which is a higher number, is better they double that after a year. So, um, so nice results after uh, one year with this. And so if we look too, we have to look at the whole picture. So for me, I'm not just looking at the patient and what their pathology is. I'm listening to them. When does it feel worse? When does it feel better? When I'm examining a lot of patients say, well, I saw the orthopedist, he put up my x-ray, and he put up my knee and your invoice. And then I examine their knee, and I see that they've got a stiff knee. So a stiff joint is a pain joint. So here's a patient in my office on the left, and they've got, I can't pull the ankle off the table. And this is the arthritic and painful knee. Whereas the other one, you can see I've got some space underneath my hand that I can pull that. So this is called their lacking terminal extension, so they can't straighten it out all the way. If you can't straighten out your knee all the way, it changes the load on your knee, and you're going to have to I get them to buy this thing on Amazon for 55 bucks. It's called the Ideal Stretch. They work on the physical therapy. And in studies that have done, they, we, we can show that just by getting terminal extension alone in these arthritic patients, we can help them put off and postpone drug replacement for years. Another thing is shoulder stiffness. So here we have, when I have the patient lying down, I'm examining shoulder, they can't inch or rotate it on the left arm as much as they can on the right. This is called glenohumeral interrotation deficit. So I say to the therapist, you need to work on uh, getting this back of the shoulder stretched out. They do these things called sleeper stretches. And also we need to restore those normal mechanics. So if we look in this shoulder, see how this left shoulder is much lower than the right, and that shoulder blade is rotated. We call this scapular dyskinesis. This creates shoulder pain as well. So we send that patient to physical therapy. A huge part of this whole um, using biologics and getting people to improve. And here, again, I use this posture shirt so you can see this guy. This is actually a base left hand baseball player. So he puts a shirt on and now he's symmetrical. And it really has a great therapeutic effect just from wearing this shirt, similar to what we get from the community. So here's some of my case presentations. These are, these are my personal cases. Uh, people can have different results. I'm just presenting some some examples of some patients that I've treated in my practice. So this is a lady 75 years old. She's had a 10-year history of shoulder pain, seen her PCP, had multiple steroid injections. Now you need to know, if you have a steroid injection in the shoulder and you have a rotator cuff tear, it significantly increases the failure rate of a rotator cuff repair because that steroid just inhibits healing. 
So here's a difficult patient. She's already had multiple steroid injections. She has decreased range of motion, abduction of 130 degrees, so she can't quite lift her arm overhead, and she's got stiffness in her shoulder. I get an MRI on her. She's got a rotator cuff tear. Her biceps doesn't look right. So I said, listen, we need to fix the shoulder. We need to fix that bicep tendon, and I'd recommend injecting fat to see if we can improve the success of the surgery. Again, off-label use for this. And so if we look, here's her rotator cuff tear, and then I've got a couple sutures in there. Pull it all down. At the beginning of the procedure, I harvested her fat. At the end, I suck all the fluid out of the shoulder because I do this all arthroscopically, and you can see this nice, shiny, yellow tissue here. This is the fat and actually sticks to the tissue there. So the physical therapists tell me, we can tell which patients that had fat injected with their rotator cuff repair because they have less pain and they seem to recover faster. So here's this lady, if you know anyone who's had a rotator cuff repair, um, this, is, this is typical for my results with injecting the adipose with this procedure. So she's two months post-op, and we look at her range of motion, which is so much better than it was um, before surgery. And so she's actually three years out. Usually they fail within the first year. So this is a challenging case with uh, multiple steroid injections and long-term history of pain. Here's another guy, he's one of my favorite patients, 79-year-old ex-NFL player. He's had lots of surgeries, and he's been having shoulder pain for years now. He doesn't want to have another surgical procedure. He's 79. But he's had steroid injections. He's had anti-inflammatories. He even had bone marrow injected. Nothing made him better. Every orthopedist he saw said he needed total shoulder. So when I saw him, he could barely raise his arm up above this level. Again, shoulder stiffness. And I said to him, you know, he didn't have a tear. So this is someone that I say, okay, let's get you in physical therapy. Let's work on range of motion. Let's improve your mechanics. And so if we look, this is what his, his shoulder x-ray looks like. So he's bone on bone here. He's got a big bone spur here. And so I send him the therapy. He's 50% better after a couple months of physical therapy. And then he says, okay, what else can we do? Because I'd like to be better. Well, let's see if we can inject something to improve the outcome and make the shoulder feel better. So and when he was three months after I injected the fat, he said I'm 95% of normal. Then I saw him two months two years later, and he said, I'm about 80%, and he had slacked off a bit with his rehab. But here he was at three months, and even though he doesn't look at he was super happy, he can bring his arm all the way overhead and bring him behind his back. And so he's just, he's very happy with his results, which he didn't get with the other dream. Here's a younger guy, 35-year-old skydiver. I had operated on his other knee about eight months prior. Now this knee popping, snapping in the kneecap. We get an MRI, and this is his MRI. So if we look, this is a section through the kneecap as well as through the femur, so through the knee. You can see this white in the patella is actually swelling in the bone because he's missing cartilage from here to here. So this light gray stuff on the surface of the bone is his cartilage, and here he's missing cartilage. And then this one is like a front view, just looking at the, the kneecap, and you can see that he's got swelling in about 25% of that patella. So I said, listen, you're having mechanical symptoms. We need to clean this up. So I go in there and go to see. And we look at the cartilage, and it's kind of like uh, an orange peel. It just kind of peels away. So here it was just a pretty large area, about two centimeters in diameter. I just carefully got rid of the unstable cartilage in there. And then after the procedure, I said, hey, what do you want to do? Because there's lots of things that we can do in orthopedics. There's all sorts of patches and everything. And he says, I want to try the lipid jumps. So at, at 12 days post-op, I injected this in his knee. And at seven weeks, he says, Doc, I feel like that defect is filling in. So this was his MRI of one year. So we can see he really healed that area where he had all that swelling. He's grown some soft tissue on his bone. I haven't biopsied it to see if it's perfect, you know, joint cartilage. But he's doing fabulous. He's two years out, two and a half years out now, and, and still doing great. And we compare the um, MRI from pre and post procedure that looks so significantly different. This is the last case I'm going to present. This is a 68-year-old guy. He at 45 had both his hips replaced and had his left knee replaced. The right knee is now hurting him. He's a skier. He's a contest player. He lives for skiing in the winter. And here's his extra. So you can see he's had this partial knee replacement on this side. He's got a good joint space here. But see how significantly decreased it is on the right side compared to the left. Now this is a guy. I see him in the office and I say, let's get you a motor brace. An unloader brace opens up that joint and loads the outside of the knee where he has good cartilage and really significantly decreases pain. He's had an unloader brace for years that he loves, but it's not working anymore. So he said, Dr. Halbert, you need to help me because ski season's coming up. I want my knee to feel better. So I injected in October. In December, he went heli skiing. He's a friend of mine, so he sent me this text message, such a perfect ski day, so this 
so fatigued I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your fat cell injection, no pain at all. So then he went through the next ski season, which was last year, and here he is um, on the mountain. Well, my name is Dennis, and I'm the lucky patient of Dr. Halberts because a couple of years ago I had some knee arthritis issues, and I got some of the fat cells that were taken out of my back process them, inject them into my knee, and it has allowed me to ski 80 days last year. I'm on about day 29 this year, on February 15th, and um, I'm just living proof that these cells are giving me an extra life. So I just talked to him um, this ski season, and he says, you know, it's still it's still helping. So, so it's really great to be able to offer something not surgical, a guy who's had extensive uh, experience with joint replacement well, to see that he's able to ski and, and, and do the things that he enjoys. So in summary, I really love to use Lipid Jones because it has that 510K device clearance. It's 361 compliant. It retains that microarchitecture. For me, it's easy to harvest because I'm a, a closet plastic surgeon, so I like to do this in the liposuction. I do it in the office. Most patients say that it feels a little weird. Um, there's more MSCs in this than there is um, in bone marrow, and I love that this company has a lot of uh, published clinical and scientific studies. So what's the future for biologics? Well, if you go on clinicaltrials.gov and you put in mesenchymal stem cells, there's about a thousand studies going on right now. So if someone does a study, whether it's patient funded or they have a grant, they have to put it on clinicaltrials.gov because they're looking and, and recruiting patients. And so you can see them using it for anything from multiple sclerosis to lupus to rheumatoid arthritis, think of anything inflammatory, Crohn's disease. So I get patients, you know, I'm on this medication, I say, hey, go to clinicaltrials.gov, see if they're doing a clinical trial in your diagnosis. And uh, But I would rec not recommend entering into a clinical trial that's patient funded. It, it, for me, it has more validity if, if, if they have a grant for funding. So my recommendation is, vet the provider, do your research. Go see someone who has expertise in musculoskeletal medicine and go online and look at studies. Go on PubMed and see about the studies. If you look at exosome studies, there aren't any human ones, okay? So, so please don't do that. That's a, use that as an illegal product. And then if you want to perhaps get enrolled in a clinical trial, to go to clinicaltrials.gov. So here, this is actually what the fat looks like under the microscope from lipogems. And so my patients, when they get this done, get this little thing that says something like that. And so, yeah. And so here we are. Thank you very much. So let's see. I don't know if there's any questions that I can address if people have written in anything. I don't have anything. So we'll go to our next presentation, which is Monica. She's going to talk to us about nutrition, which is really important um, in, in regenerative medicine in general for our orthopedic conditions. Thank you. Well, I hope you guys are excited by what you heard and that there are uh, something new to consider for any orthopedic troubles that you might have. And uh, Dr. Halbrecht is a great communicator, so don't be shy about asking questions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about nutrition for healing, particularly as it relates to what she was talking about. You saw some of the pictures where she's harvesting fat, so that, that's a little bit of, um, you know, a, shock to your system and they're injecting then the fat cells into whatever joint she's working with you on and that's a little bit of a shock to the system and also you're going to be doing healing processes either before the treatment or and or after the treatment in terms of physical therapy and so one of the things you want to concentrate on is reducing your inflammation so if you can start early before the procedures and reduce inflammation, chances are you're going to heal faster and have less pain. So I am Monica Tarr and I'm a health coach locally here in Coeur d'Alene, but I work with people all over the country. And uh, I help folks do a lot of different things. I specialize in brain health, which has a ton to do with inflammation. So I deal with inflammation a lot. Also weight loss, blood pressure, lowering people's cholesterol, managing diabetes. And so, uh, and that's all exacerbated by inflammation. So just a really quick one-page primer on what inflammation is. 
There are two different kinds uh, that the doctors refer to as acute, which means it comes on fast, it hurts, it turns stuff red, it might bleed, it might be scratched. It's like falling off your mountain bike, and if you've ever done that, you've seen the bruises and the scratches and you've experienced the pain. That's acute inflammation. It's usually due to having an infection somewhere or getting injured. It usually lasts a few days to a couple of weeks. It could be even like a dentist appointment where you would get some acute inflammation after a procedure, say, at the dentist if you had a root canal, so you may have felt that. There's pain, redness, and swelling. Oftentimes, you can treat that with some over-the-counter pain meds like Enzys or Tylenol, whatever your doctor would recommend. And then the outcome is it usually just goes away. If something goes wrong with an acute inflammation, you're going to know. Um, it's going to abscess and turn achy and hurt, and you might get a fever, and then you're going to go see the doctor. It's very obvious to you that something's not right with the healing process. It could turn into something that chronically fatigues you. Also, if, you're, if you have sort of this low-lying infection, say, like an abscess tooth that just kind of sort of comes and goes. Um, now, if you have chronic inflammation, that's a bit differently. It is often what we call silent. We don't know that we have it. Some of the causes are that you had an untreated acute injury that just sort of snowballed into something that becomes chronic and lasts for a long period of time. Maybe there's a foreign substance in your body. There's a lot in the media today about mold toxicity. That would be what we might refer to as a foreign substance. And maybe you're having an autoimmune reaction to something. You can think of those folks as, I count myself in there, sort of. I have a wonky thyroid. Um, other people have things like rheumatoid arthritis or colitis, uh, those types of things where your immune system is sort of attacking you because it thinks that there's something foreign in there. Chronic inflammation can last for weeks, months, or years. Um, I can speak to the years part. It's not too fun. It usually results in fatigue. You just cannot feel rested. You can't find any energy, brain fog, where you just you can't think straight. Maybe you can't focus or concentrate for a long period of time. General aches and pains you might think of in terms of like arthritis type stuff or even sort of minor flu type symptoms. Um, and stomach discomfort, particularly with things like colitis or irritable bowel. And then what is the outcome? Could be that the outcome is chronic disease. So things that you might be familiar with like diabetes and heart disease, they have inflammatory processes that go along with them and they last for years if not a lifetime once they get kicked up. So rheumatoid arthritis can result in tissue damage in people's joints. Or you might have an ongoing autoimmune disorder for which maybe you need to take medicine or you have to manage the symptoms through diet, exercise, and lifestyle changes. So uh, any quick questions about what inflammation is before we move on? Doesn't look like it. Okay, so what do you do to get rid of it? That's the big deal, right? You eat vegetables, lots of them. Dr. Terry Wells specializes in helping people uh, cure MS or at least abate the symptoms. And in her book, The Wells Protocol, she suggests nine cups of vegetables per day. Now, I'm going to step out from here. You guys can see I'm a pretty small person, so I get to do seven cups of vegetables, but I still shoot for nine. So if you're a regular sized person, shoot for nine cups a day. If you're a little person, you can get by with seven. Um, and what, what counts? Uh, pretty much everything across the spectrum. So we kind of group them into these three groups. And uh, greens are in one group. You can see in the presentation the, the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that you get out of greens. All of those nutrients are considered anti-inflammatory. And you can see how the list is slightly longer underneath the greens. And that's because those are your powerhouses. So when I plan meals, I always stuff as many greens as I can. And then I augment with colorful vegetables and fruits like berries, beets, carrots, tomatoes, purple cabbage, and they have things that greens don't, like anthocyanins, that's what turns blueberries purple, and better folic acid in there. And then you have another group, which is sulfur rich, and that's where your things like cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, garlic, onions, mushrooms, some root vegetables like radishes, and you can see in the list of nutrients that they have things in them that the other two classes don't. 
So it's really important to get variety across all three of these. Uh, and just an aside, for anybody who's attending, um, I'd be happy to give you access to this presentation if you'll just either make a comment on the Facebook Live or you can email me and I'll have the email address at the end of this presentation. Hydrate. You have to hydrate to heal. You have to feed the body with water. And a lot of people ask, and I asked this too as I was learning a bit more, well, how much is enough? So the common feeling is it's your weight divided by two, and that equals the number of daily ounces. Okay? So if you weigh 150 pounds, you should drink 75 ounces of water. So what I suggest to people as far as a hack on how do I get this much water down my throat, find some vessels in your kitchen, preferably metal or uh, glass, and measure them out with a measuring cup until you reach the number of ounces that is your target for the day. Pre-fill those and take them wherever you go. Dr. Halbert, why do we want to consume so much water? So it's, uh, it helps to lower inflammation in general, but it also releases the toxins in your body, which when you're healing, you've got all kinds of cells dying and you need to go. You have other cells that need to do um, regenerative types of things. And from anybody who remembers anything from early chemistry class, that was maybe a pinch of your biology class, pretty much anything that a cell does, any chemical reaction that a cell does in order to conduct its business within our body requires water in order to complete that chemical process. So if you starve the body for water, the cells in our body that are doing all the good things that they're supposed to do can't complete their tasks. And so you really have to get the, the water in the body so the cells can do what they need to do. And that goes for anything from blood cells to brain cells. But in a procedure like the regenerative medicine where things are being disturbed and new things are being added in order to heal a joint, you want to give the body plenty of water to clean itself but also to complete the regenerative process. Did you want to add something? Mm -hmm. that, well, that's in, our, in my instructions, we have we have instructions with regard to consumption of water, you know, pre and post procedure. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and, you'll, and if this seems foreign to you and like you're never going to get that much water down your face, carry that, carry your daily ounces around with you. And then I can pretty much promise that if you get to a day where you short yourself on water, once you've gotten used to drinking that many ounces, you will actually feel thirsty. You might feel tired. I get a headache when I don't drink enough water. Um, so you'll, you'll begin to notice and you'll begin to miss it. Um, but yeah, the secret hack that I found works is car carry your allotment with you uh, wherever you go. And I'm afraid you're going to have to give sugar the boot. I know, it's hard. I'm a confessed addict. Uh, so there's sugar and then there's sugar. There's the sugar that's obvious that we love. It's in desserts and it's in treats. It's in regular soda, in other words, not diet soda. And it's the added sugar that we might be putting in our coffee or on top of our grapefruit in the morning, or it might be honey, it might be coconut sugar, it might be molasses, it might be something else that we're adding that we think is good sugar, but it's still added sugar to our diet. And sugar is hands down inflammatory, no questions about it. There's tons of studies out there. Dr. Halbert mentioned PubMed. Go to PubMed, type in inflammation and sugar, and you'll get thousands of responses. Read through it and make your own decisions. Uh, I know it's very difficult to give sugar up. It takes about three weeks. It's miserable in, in week one and two, and after week two, you'll start to feel better, and then you'll give it up, and you'll have birthday cake somewhere, and you'll want to feel like you want to throw up because it won't taste good, and it will be such a relief. There's also the not so obvious sugar. So as you're moseying around, picking up crackers or whatever that you like to munch on, read the labels, make the selections that have the smallest grams of sugar and the least added sugar. Um, energy bars are loaded with sugar, so please read the labels and see if you can pick the ones with the highest fiber and the lowest sugar. And then beverages. 
And if you are going to have sugar, please don't drink your sugar. It can be completely avoided. So um, just look out. If you're going to treat yourself, that's awesome. Make it, um, make it super special to yourself. Uh, I call it conscious treating. So if you're going to have sugar, make sure it's with people you love to be with, something you love, and you're going to make a big deal out of it. There are sneaky sugars that don't look or taste anything like sugar. And those are what we call high glycemic foods. And what these do is produce a lot of sugar, convert to sugar once you've adjusted them. This probably won't be a surprise to a lot of you because there's been so much discussion about lower carbs. But high glycemic foods don't have a lot of sugar added to them, but they do increase your blood sugar. And that can lead to chronic inflammation just as regular sugar can. It can also lead to a lot of unwanted weight gain. So these are things like white rice, regular pasta, cereals that have been highly processed, uh, crackers, and regular bread. Uh, so if you're going to choose to eat some of these foods, I would say choose the best quality you can. Try to minimize them. Try to choose ones that are made with whole grains where the grains are left as whole as possible. So maybe instead of a cornflakes kind of a cereal, you'll, you'll have steel cut oats. Maybe instead of a white bread, you'll choose a whole grain bread. And maybe instead of a regular cracker, you'll choose a nut or seed based cracker. And then just watch your por portion sizes and make sure that these treats, and consider them treats, have a, a good fiber content and that will slow down the response that your body gives for that sugar punch and where it releases tons of glucose into your body. And I might say, programs have tons of good choices here. So. <laughs> And they've got tons of homemade breads and great pastas and great bulk sections. So go nutty in the bulk section. Healing fats. Uh, those of us who grew up during the 80s where it thought fat was the enemy, it is not the enemy. There are lots of healthy fats. Um, and so they also help reduce inflammation. And there are lots of studies on there. So you could go to PubMed again. You could look up healthy fats and inflammation in the search bar. And get a whole bunch of returns where they've done studies with specific foods. So here are the top list of healthy fats. Uh, healthy fats come in a variety of fish. We're probably most familiar with salmon. Now don't curl your nose up at these ones. Mackerel, sardines, and anchovies are also on the list. And you may think that those sound absolutely disgusting, but next time you're making a red sauce at home with meatballs or something like that, Open up a can of anchovies, take two or three anchovies, mush them up, and throw them in the sauce. No one will know. Next time you make meatloaf, do the same. Don't tell anyone in the house. But it adds omega-3s to your meal, and nobody will notice, and you can do a sip back and laugh at them later. Uh, chocolate, and by chocolate, I mean the sort of 80% cocoa variety, or straight-up cocoa. So if you're making yourself a latte, you can use straight-up cocoa and decide if and how you want to sweeten it. Um, I have to say I can frequently be found in the chocolate aisle here at Pilgrims, digging through the 80% and above chocolates. I think I've taken talked to all of them. There's lots of good choices here. Um, go ahead and treat yourself with a little bit of chocolate. Not the whole bar, just a couple of cores. Olive oil, avocado, nuts and seeds, and eggs. Um, and by the way, duck eggs are pretty easily found um, here at Pilgrims and at other places, or you might have friends that have ducks, you can give duck, duck eggs a try. And then really the last thing is sleep, and I can't stress this enough. It's kind of a badge of honor in today's society, in our country anyway, that if we can uh, do more work, get less sleep, and shout that out to the public that we get some sort of badge. Uh, but really, sleep is extremely important to reducing and preventing inflammation and all of the chronic diseases that accompany it. So I've spent all of last year's packing my sleep. And here are the top things that have worked for me and have worked for clients. Standardized bedtime and wake times. And I know you're going to give me the thumbs down. But even on weekends, <laughs> once you set a standard bedtime and wake time, you'll automatically wake up that way on the weekends, and you won't feel tired. And if there's an occasional party, you're out later before sleeping. You want a cool, dark, quiet room, especially up here in North Idaho, where it stays light really late in the 
summer. We finally bit the bullet and did blackout curtains, and my husband and I slept better than we ever had. Um, limit computer, phone, and tablet exposure two hours before bedtime. You're hearing a lot about blue light, and you can get blue light blocking glasses. Uh, but really what I found in experimenting with this was if I just set them down, and it's those free. I can watch TV and not have a problem because it's farther away from my face. But if I get the computer up close, the tablet up close, too much Netflix in bed, um, or the phone, then I will stay awake and not be able to go to bed at my bedtime, and I won't feel very good the next day. Um, finish meals two to three hours before you go to bed. That's always a great thing if you can strive for that. And these are all, do these as often as possible, not be perfect all the time. And the last thing is some sort of relaxation. And you might not get to this every day, but if you can squeeze these in a couple days a week, I think that you'll feel hopefully what I felt, particularly for bath and sauna. If you take a bath or a sauna, it's pulling the blood away from the cold body and sending it out to the extremities. And the sleep researchers say that we sleep better and fall asleep easier if our core temperature drops a little bit. And that has been my personal experience. And that seems to be why we can fall asleep in the hat after a month back. And then we tend to stay asleep and feel really rested the next day. Um, Meditation is great, reading a nice uplifting book, not sort of a graphic gory novel probably. Uh, some prayer, that's a, a lot of people prefer uh, to do a little prayer before they go to bed. And also a little bit of gratitude, either writing in a gratitude journal or just thinking of a few things that you're grateful for as you drift off into sleep. So you can reach me a couple different ways. Uh, my phone number is 208-651-9193. You can reach me there, Monica, at RestoreAndRenew.com. The website, RestoreAndRenew.com. You can send me messages there. Dr. Halper, do you recommend any type of diet like uh, South Beach or Mediterranean? Mediterranean in general, uh, although I would, uh, when I when I say Mediterranean to a lot of clients, their eyes light up. They're like, Woohoo, I can have pasta and bread and all those kinds of things that they associate with Italian food. This Mediterranean person would have where things like breads and desserts are more a small part of the meal and things like fish and olive oil and vegetables and the beans are a larger part of their meal. Um, they also don't tend to overeat and they do tend to eat with people they love. And that's actually a pretty big deal. People digest their food and get more nutrients out of it when they're not stressed. So um, I like Mediterranean best. It's an easy place to start for most people. Um, if you're going to go a little bit more hardcore into something like a paleo or a ketogenic diet, please talk to your physician first um, because they do need to understand some things about your blood work before you can be that hands up on them. And, and uh, anything that we talked about here in reducing inflammation, assuming you're not eating gigantic quantities of food, um, the side effect is that you may lose weight if you want to. So thanks everybody for joining us and I really appreciate your attention. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.